Hello, you're watching the Great Canadian Bow here, and today we have the next Canadian federal election forecast update. Now, before I begin, I just once again like to shout out on my channel members. You greatly support the channel, really appreciate what you guys do. And if you guys want to support the channel, just go down below and hit the join button. But if you can't afford to do that, I understand. And by all means, just like, share, subscribe, comment below all your basic YouTube things. But with that, let us begin. So, yet again, we have the Conservatives incrementally increasing their lead. Now, we actually have quite a large variance of polls this month. Not because there's some polls saying the Conservatives are doing bad, but because some polls are saying they're doing really flippin' good. So, in fact, actually, let's just bring over this so we can take a look at it. So look at this. This is the raw, right? So in February, the high point was a about 19 points, give or take, lead found by Abacus on February 7th. We now have a 21-point lead found by Main Street on March 9th. But it's more than just that. The range in February was about 3 points. Now the range is about 6 points for the conservative vote share. But most of them are now north of 41. We have 41, we have 42.8, we have 42, we have 46. Even this one, 40.6, is ran up about 41. So the conservatives are continuing to climb higher and higher in the polls. Despite what some people have said or some people are asserting, there really does not seem to be this approaching to a ceiling. They're not going anywhere, or plateauing anywhere, I should say. But it's more than that, too. We also seem to have an interesting development here. Note the Liberals here are probably losing a bit of ground. We got 323 so far this month, and in February there was only two. But one of them was a 23.8, so that's nearly a 24. So it, there might be some, some downward momentum on the Liberals there, but it's not a lot. But what I find actually the most interesting is... Specifically, the NDP. Now, first off, we're going to just straight up drop the Nanos polls just from this high-level view. Because it's not very useful. Because Nanos always polls the NDP very high. So, in February, we had an 18, a 19, and an 18 from two Abacus and one Ledger poll. Going back into January, we had a 20 from a Ledger poll, a 16 from Main Street, 20 from Ipsos and Abacus, 20 from Angus Reed. 18 from Abacus. So about 19 in raw, maybe 20. We want to be generous. Now my model doesn't forecast that because I consider things like strategic voting and pulling error and stuff like that, which does happen though. It's pulling errors on the tame side. We're not talking a like, huge misses here, but anyways, I forecast this. But now we're looking in March. Now, not a huge sample size, especially since we're dropping the two nanos pulls. But we have an 18, a 21, and a 15. Just with those three polls, that actually suggests the average might be below or dropping. It's about 18 now. Now, three polls, it could just be anomalous. could just be a case of this one Main Street poll has a big, big weight. But it's something we definitely want to watch out for. And it's not something entirely unprecedented. Show what I mean? We have some data here. This is from all the by-elections in this parliament. So, starting with the Mississauga Lakeshore one, all the way up to the most recent Durham by-election. So here is what the results were in these ridings in 2021. And here is what the results are in these ridings now. And this is comparable because these are the same boundaries so far. The spring-summer by-elections of this coming calendar year are not going to be directly comparable to 2021 results, but we can do some fancy math stuff to actually compare them, but more on that when that comes. So the big thing to notice here is the NDP is actually down nearly six points. So this is this is the change factoring all of the by-elections. Now, this is not the most indicative change, and you should not overread into these numbers because small sampling or anomalous results such as Oxford, where the conservatives did really poorly, or ones like Mississauga Lakeshore, where they were just really early, so before any movement had really happened, Definitely going to weight this differently. And in fact, we go here. This one is removing Oxford. And now this is the conservative swing, four points. Liberals gained 0.3. 
So just removing Oxford is quite a big difference. But the main thing I'm talking about here isn't actually Liberals or the Conservatives. It's the NDP. The NDP are down nearly six points by this metric. So on the surface level, and many people, rightly speaking, have argued that the NDP usually underperforms by elections. They normally do bad in them, if you will. However, this is the 2015 parliament. So right here is the by-elections, and this was the 2015 election result. We have lots of data here. So we have nearly, what is this, 18 by-elections. So quite a lot of data, but it's now usually, or most of these are from 2017 and 2018. So they're a little old because a lot happens in 2019, and it's not captured in any of these by-elections. So again, it's not directly comparable. And here's an example of why you see this. In the actual 2019 election, the Liberals lost 6.4 points. The by-elections suggest they only lost 2.5 because the by-elections occurred, or one to three years technically, before the actual election date. And 2019 was a very big year. But one thing worth capturing here is the NDP lost 3.8 points in 2019 and 5.78 in the by-elections. Which, again, as many people have mentioned before, is something we do expect from the NDP. They seem to be really bad at get out the vote in by-elections. Probably because in a lot of these cases, in a lot of these by-elections, the result's not really in doubt. Very few by-elections are actually contestable in practice. Especially for a third party like the NDP. So their get out to vote is lower. Sure, that makes sense. But we're still looking at, by implication here, now, sure, this is one parliament. I could expand this search to more parliaments, but this is a four-point drop in 2019 for the NDP. And they lost six points in between elections. So there's a overperform by elections by about two points, perhaps, let's say. And I also will note, too, that this kind of change is also something that 2019, the year of 2019, could also influence, too. The Liberals lost more voters in 2019 than they lost in the by-elections. And part of those voters could have been going to NDP because they were unhappy with SNC-Lavalin or whatever. But going back to here, we look at our overall aggregate. If we take the same assumption that the NDP will perform two points better than they did in these by-elections, and we can generalize this, which we don't quite have enough data points yet, but after this summer we really should. I think we're, we're owed like three or four by-elections now. More, I should say. And 11 is a pretty good sample size, especially because it'll be across quite a few uh, provinces now. We have four, obviously, but we're going to get more in those four. And I think another province owes us a by-election. I can't remember which one. Maybe it's BC? Doesn't matter. Hmm. So we can kind of have this assumption here that Perhaps the NDP are actually set to lose about four points in from 2021 to 2025. And perhaps the Liberals aren't going to lose quite as much as the polls suggest. Which, if you note, I actually forecast this. I don't think the Liberals are doing nearly as bad as the polls are saying. I don't think they're doing good by any means, but I think some of the projections, such as 338, which, again, no shade at 338, I think he does a good job, and I think his overall stuff is sound, but I think he's a little too fast in how he's dropping the Liberals, according to polls. And yes, the polls raw do say that. So there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. I just think my methodology is better. <laughs> but anyways, so the Liberals are probably going to do slightly better than the NDP come election time compared to the polls. And the Conservatives will likely also do better than the polls say, because they usually do. And... I think there's a couple big reasons for this. Like, I don't think this is just a case of the voter fortune or strategic voting. I think we're actually seeing party coalitions meaningfully change. And I think what really started this ball rolling, what started the pitch, the specific cause of the modern political realignment in Canada, because there's also two general causes I could outline, but the specific cause was Jagmeet Singh. Jagmeet Singh himself is the very specific cause in federal politics in Canada for the decline of the NDP and the Liberals moving to the left. Not Trudeau, not Scheer, not Harper, not O'Toole, not even Poiliev. 
Jagmeet Singh, or is it Jagmeet Singh? I think it's Jagmeet Singh, and I apologize if that's actually how you pronounce his name. I've been doing it wrong this entire time. If you haven't got before, I'm terrible at names. <laughs> I was mispronouncing Notley's name for like a year, and no one corrected me in the comments. You should do that, by the way. If I'm pronouncing a name wrong. Anyways, so Singh, why is he such a big factor? Why is he the specific cause? Well, first, you must understand, there's all these general causes going on. There's changing global environment, there's changing economic environment, there's changing technology, there's changing social behaviors. All of these things affect coalitions. There's changing people in leadership that changes coalitions. But Singh is the specific cause because Singh represents a change in the NDP's mindset. The NDP of Leighton, or Mulcair, or Tommy Douglas, or, um, I haven't read, I can't forget the other guy's name, but the, the Ed Broadbent. Broadbent? That's his name. Those NDP leaders were much more what you would call old school trade unionists. Now, these guys are a working class focused NDP. They're really concerned about fiscal issues, and they're not very concerned about social issues. They want the government to support people who can't, by regular economic means, normally support themselves, or at least can't always support themselves, such as during a crisis. Now, this NDP never really had much of a chance at beating the liberals or the conservatives, and that's you can tell this because they have never done it federally. There was a brief moment under Leighton where they were very close, but they were never able to secure the pooch. Provincially, it, this style has worked in places like Manitoba or places like Alberta. A little bit BC, though BC is a little... Unlike the other Western NDPs, the BC one is a little more like overtly socially liberal, I should say. But that's because BC is more left-wing than the other three provinces in the west of Canada. At least, for the most part. But what this NDP-style party does is it means that the working class trade union voter, the private sector trade union voter, has a specific political home. They're not likely going to vote conservative or liberal. They might vote Bloc in Quebec for various reasons. Maybe they'll vote Green in some cases. But they're not likely going to vote conservative or liberal in major quantities. And this meant specific areas of the country, London, Windsor, Niagara, Hamilton, lots of rural BC, this area in particular of rural BC, the entire province of Saskatchewan. A lot of these areas were very competitive, or, or Northern Ontario as well as another one, were utterly dominated by the NDP because there's a lot of unionized workers in these areas, a lot of working class people in these areas who would vote NDP because they like the sort of soft to hard fiscal liberalism. They want the government to spend money to support workers, but they're not very up on social issues. They don't care or want anyone talking about them. It's not a big concern for them. In fact, they may actually oppose outright in totality social liberalism. An example of this being my future father-in-law, who is the archetypical type of person who voted NDP straight ticket for his entire life until Singh, because Singh changed the formula. Now, it's not intrinsically wrong for Singh to try to change the formula. That formula wasn't going to make them win. There was no obvious path to victory there other than the conservatives and the liberals completely screwing the pooch. Examples being Ontario or my own Nova Scotia provincially, where the NDP have won one provincial government once in each province, Precisely in a situation where the voter base thought the PCs and the Liberals both screwed up. And I don't recall the exact details of Bob Ray in Ontario, but in Nova Scotia, it was during the 2009 financial crisis that this happened. So again, not that surprising. That is, in the 2009 fiscal crisis, the incumbent PCs are going to be replaced by the NDP and not the fiscally conservative Nova Scotia Liberal Party. That's not what people normally want in a crisis like that, but anyways... It's also not surprising that they were then, NDP was then replaced by the MSLP, but I digress. 
So Singh changed this formula specifically on purpose because the NDP cannot win federally in its old coalition. Its old coalition was enough to give them 40, 50, 60 seats sometimes. Every now and then in a blue moon could get 100 seats. There's only one blue moon, but you know, it happened. Unfortunately, Singh's proposal, his changes, was basically to discard, not intentionally, I might add, but to discard this working class trade union voter in favor of the urbanite, young, soft socialist. I say soft socialist because very few of these voters are actually literally socialists. They might say or self-identify as a socialist, but they're not actually a socialist, if you look at what they believe. They kind of, they LARP as socialists, if we will. That was the kind of person Singh chased after. But that is a very different voter category. Oh, I should also say university-educated bureaucrats, too. It was another big group that he's going after. And that's a very different group. Because the liberals had actually very little appeal as a party to the working class unionized voter. It's why they never voted for them. It's why the NDP existed. Like the NDP didn't just spawn out of the ether because people were like, oh, I want to make a party. No, no, no. That spawned because the liberals couldn't cater to those voters. And at the time, the conservatives also didn't particularly care for them. Look at Brian Mulroney's. Your working class trade union voter is not going to vote for Brian Mulroney. It's not going to happen. You might like Brian Mulroney, but that kind of voter is not going to vote for him. What really happened here is since Singh pivoted, what he's actually doing, in effect, the target voter he's now going for, is actually the core of the liberal voter base. If you look at the Chans or the Trudeaus, who was their main base? Bureaucrats? Urbanites? Socially liberal voters? People who are willing, or at least open to the idea of spending government money to do things, but they don't want to spend too much? So they're not super fiscally liberal, a little more fiscally conservative than, say, your old school trade unionist is, but they're still not fis remotely fiscally conservative. Like, you're Inner city, that's the bad way to phrase it, your urbanite professional young woman, like the archetypical left-wing voter today, is fiscally liberal. But they're not fiscally liberal in the same way that your old school trade unionist is. Again, to use the example of my future father-in-law, he's the kind of guy who on social concern on every single issue you can possibly name, but he wants universal pharmacare. He wants universal dental care and not the weak pussy footed programs that Trudeau is introducing now. No, like full fledged universal. He wants those. He thinks it'd be good. And that's his opinion. That's valid. That's fine. The other demographic I highlighted here, the urbanite professional young woman likes the idea of supporting others, but doesn't want it to be in usual terms as broad. They're more the kind of person who wants the mean-tested program. They don't want the rich to benefit. That kind of person. That was a traditional liberal base. People who want to help the poor by spending money, but don't want to help the rich. Whereas the old school trade unionist doesn't care. That distinction doesn't mean anything to them. And those voters still, both of those voter camps still exist today, I should note. But since the NDP pivoted into attacking effectively the core liberal base... The ridings that Singh is going for are core central Toronto, maybe Montreal, central Vancouver area, some extent Winnipeg too, and Ottawa. That means the Liberals had to move to contest the NDP. They had to react to it. Climate is a really big one. The NDP, to a lesser extent, the Greens, because remember way back when, 2019, the Greens were a serious threat to defeat the NDP. Singh managed to pull that, that election together, but there is a reality where Singh fumbles that election. Elizabeth May is the third party, or fourth party right now. So because Singh forced 
in a sense, the liberals to pivot left on fiscal issues, not just on social issues, fiscal issues, to combat losing their core base, because Singh was trying to go to this core base, the bureaucrat, the professional, etc., and say to them, yeah, we're as socially liberal as the liberals, but we're willing to spend a little more money than them. You should vote for us. And they're like, that's, that's a compelling argument. So Trudeau's reaction to this is to spend more money. That's why you see 2015 to 2019, the Trudeau government is fairly fiscally moderate. Rampant deficit spending, but it's controlled deficit spending. You see 2021 onward, and it's out of control. They're just shoveling money out the door on every single program because they are trying to ward off the NDP. Trying to defeat the NDP. And in fact, I think, we don't know the full details on this, but I think if it ever was published, it was Trudeau who went to Singh offering the competence supply agreement. And he did that not because Trudeau felt like he needed Singh's assurances to stay in power, not because Trudeau really feared a non-confidence vote, he did that as a poison pill to the NDP. Because if Singh refused, Trudeau could go to the public and say, hey, look, we offered the NDP for confidence and supply. We're going to do dental and pharma. And Singh said, no, you should never vote NDP. They're losers. Okay. So Singh had to say yes. But by saying yes, he dooms his own party. Why does he do to his own party? Well, in a much the similar way that the minority governments of the past, 60s and 70s, really stymied the NDP growing because the liberals co-opted their agenda, this is the exact same thing right now. Federally, the liberals are co-opting the NDP agenda. Dental care is now the liberal policy. Pharmacare is now the liberal policy. These are not NDP proposals anymore. They're the liberal ones, because the liberal party did them. Yeah, the NDP backed it and voted for it, but that doesn't matter. They wouldn't have happened without the 100 and, I think, 58 technically right now, liberal MPs backing it. Without those MPs on board, it wouldn't have happened. So no matter how much Singh wants to say that it's his idea, it fundamentally isn't. Even if he was the one who proposed it, it's fundamentally not his idea because it could not have happened without Trudeau doing it. Which is why I think, now this is early yet, I could be completely wrong here, but I think the NDP are going to decline towards the summer, especially after this budget comes out. Because Pharmacare, the liberals are opposing it, the liberals promising to implement it, is a death blow to the NDP. It basically sucks out all of the wind from their sails. It's not just a full defense from the liberals of their core base. It's actually a counteroffensive at this kind of base that they historically could not win. The unionized trade union voter. Now, a lot of these voters are not going to vote liberal because the liberals are too socially liberal. It's now something the liberals can theoretically contest the NDP on because they're doing the same things. Now, they're not the same party yet. I have something planned coming up the works. We're going to talk about that in more detail. But for now, they're not the same party, but they're contesting each other quite heavily. And I think it's very safe to say that especially after about 2022-2023, Trudeau's game plan is not defeat Poilievre. Trudeau's given up. He's consigned to lose 2025. His game plan is not to win. His game plan is to destroy the NDP. And why does he want to destroy the NDP? Because Trudeau doesn't want to be known as the last liberal prime minister of Canada. He doesn't want the liberal party to die without him. And the only way to guarantee that the liberal party can rebound again once he loses 2025 is to destroy the NDP, to drag the NDP down into the mud with him. In a sense, Trudeau is the captain of a sinking ship and he has handcuffed himself to the wheel and has handcuffed himself to his co-captain, Jagmeet Singh, and he's looking at Singh right in the eyes and says, I'm going down, but you're going down with me, and there's nothing you can do about it. And that's what's happening. 
That's why Trudeau's not going to call a snap election. He's going to wait to the last minute, September 2025. He's going to call it. He's going to lose. He's going to take the biggest loss in liberal history, probably, in terms of seat losses. Maybe, yeah, I think it's probably, probably going to be the biggest, but we'll see. And he's going to take that on the chin. It's going to be a humiliating loss for him. But the silver lining for Trudeau is at the end of the day, the Liberal Party will rebound because the NDP will be dead. Federally. At least for a while. Maybe eventually another NDP leader will come out who can rebuild. But for now, it's going to take a while. Because when we get the other half of this realignment, it has not gone, gone unnoticed from Conservative High Command, from people like Pierre Polyev, or other high-level Conservative leaders. Now, wait a minute. No one speaks for the working-class trade union voter. This is a substantial portion of the population. They're actually a very politically useful portion of the population. They're a very concentrated portion of the population. Because that's one thing to keep in mind, too. It doesn't matter if your demographic is large, if it's uniformly spread. If you have 5,000 people in every single riding, you're not very useful. If you have 40,000 people in one-eighth of the ridings, you're very critical and people will care about you. That's why the Francophone in Quebec is a vote people care about talking about, but the Francophone across the prairies is an irrelevant, or perhaps New Brunswick is a better example. The Acadian is like an actual demographic that people consider and worry about voting for, or getting the vote of. The Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta, BC Francophone, probably about the same number of actual people, is basically borderline irrelevant because they're too spread out. They're too dilute. Whereas the Acadians dominate a few ridings. I think about four, maybe five, depending on how much Mary Machi is actually Francophone these days. I don't actually know, offhand. But the key point here is Polya and other conservative leaders, such as Ford, as an example, have seen that the NDP's evacuating this working class base and has decided to go full hog in to win them. And that's why we're seeing in a lot of areas, nationally, provincially, it's mostly in the east of Canada, I will note, traditionally working class areas are voting conservative because conservative parties in Canada are more willing to look at these voters and say, yeah, we vibe, we agree on the social issues, right? And we'll be a little, a little more fiscally liberal. We're not, we're not fiscal liberals, mind you, but we're not going to be as tight-fisted. Notice federally, Wally was not talking about axing many programs. And he almost certainly won't. Yeah, something like childcare might go, because it's, it's actually just a bad program, but anyways, I don't want to go into that. It's not a scope for the video. But dental care probably won't go anywhere. Pharmacare might, depending on the timeline of the election and how much the program's actually rolled out. If it fully exists, it might not go anywhere. Like dental care, it's probably going to be fully functional by the time that election happens, so it probably won't go anywhere as a result. The disability stuff, if that actually happens, that probably won't go anywhere. A lot of these programs the Liberals created are not likely going to move. What we're going to see Paulie is trying to save money on is slowing spending growth, probably cutting back on contracting, stuff like that, axing a bunch of quote-unquote economic stimulus things like the investment bank and stuff like that, which is sort of a policy that a lot of working class voters actually like anyways. Corporate welfare is very unpopular with that demographic. And yeah, you can argue the investment bank isn't actually corporate welfare, but it's also like a terrible program that doesn't do anything. So it's just kind of a waste of money. There's other sorts of corporate welfare too that will probably get axed. The conservatives have highlighted several times in the past things like I don't know, Trudeau helping, I think it was Loblaws replace freezers back in like 2019 for like hundreds of thousands of dollars, something like that, for environmental reasons. There's all sorts of ones. And that's where you're probably going to see him try to save the money on not by cutting a lot of these big programs because that's his main pitch to a lot of these voters. He can't look at them in the eyes and say, we're going to be fiscally liberal. No one will believe him. But he can look them in the eyes and basically assure them that we're not going to do that. We're going to be fiscally responsible. We're not going to take your programs. And he's right to do so. That would be the correct move politically to do. And if quality of government does act like this, focuses on saving money by cutting corporate welfare or cutting unnecessary contracting costs, cutting bloated bureaucracy where it's bloated, just slowing spending growth, 
especially on new programs, but keeps all the existing programs, he'll probably be very popular among this demographic, the working class voter. And that's why we're seeing places like London, Windsor, all of Niagara now, even Hamilton, Northern Ontario, coastal BC. A lot of these areas are starting to flip conservative. And that shouldn't be a surprise, because at the same time the NDP's pivoted to try to attack the Liberals, the Liberals have pivoted back to defend themselves, and they've left a large swath open right here that the Conservatives are walking up. This is not a coincidence. It's not a surprise. One of the reasons, specifically, right now, that probably was hitting 41 in some cases, 46% isn't strictly because Poilyev is the best leader in the world. is isn't strictly because he's the best campaigner in the world. is isn't strictly because he's people think he's the better leader. All of those things matter. His campaigning skills, his work ethic, people liking him. Those things matter, don't get me wrong. But a large part of that is he's smartly and adeptly spotted an area where there's an opening the growing closeness of the Liberals and the NDP as both the NDP tax to attack the Liberals and the Liberals attack back has actually left a large vote open. You have the more centrist Liberals who are really concerned about fiscal issues, overspending. They're open to the Conservatives now. You have the working class voter, the socially conservative working class voter who doesn't like all this social crap but kind of wants spending money. Well, the Conservatives can win that guy too by promising not to do any of that social crap, reversing some of it even, and then going on to be a little more moderate on spending. And these voters know what they're getting into. They know what these parties are. They know who these leaders are. People aren't stupid. And that's, broadly speaking, the overall trend that's causing this drive here. This specific cause was sing. Now, there's also the general causes that that are required for Singh to do this. Singh could not have done this in 2000 if he was elected leader of the NDP. But because we're in the current era, we're in today, he had the capacity, the flexibility to try to make this attack on the liberals, and it's utterly failed. Which is why if we go back to the opening of the video, where I was talking about their numbers being quite bad, their by-election numbers, I think it's perfectly reasonable we could see the NDP sub-14% on E-Day in 2025. They're not there yet. Currently, actually, have them performing exactly as well as they did in 2019 or 2021. But I think there is a very distinct possibility, if all things trend the way they are, we will see the NDP sub-14, and the Liberals will still be in the mid-20s. Because at this stage, especially once you get around 25% for the Liberals, that's roughly their floor. Singh doesn't have a floor, at least in practice, because a lot of people who like Singh also like Trudeau, but they like Trudeau more because he's doing things. And also, Singh kind of looks like a fool in a lot of his ads, too. He doesn't know how to act like a leader very well, but that's, that's a whole other topic for another time. But with that, I bid you adieu, and I will see you next week.